Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nucleus Investment Insights. We have a special guest this week in author, academic and leading Australian China Export Authority, Salvatore Babones. Dr. Babones is an Associate Professor at the University of Sydney and an Adjunct Scholar at the Centre for Independent Studies. He's authored several books, dozens of academic research articles and has contributed to a wide array of media publications such as Quadrant, Foreign Policy and Foreign Affairs. Last month, Dr. Babones released seminal research on Australia's export exposure to the coronavirus epidemic, and he's joined us to talk about this topic today. And just a quick reminder that before we get started, to subscribe on YouTube and click the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch, or of course, follow us on your preferred podcast platform. We hope you enjoy. Today on the show, we have special guest in author, academic, and leading Australia China Export Authority, Salvatore Babones. Welcome to Nucleus Investment Insights. Thanks for having me on the program. Wonderful. So just to uh, begin, we, we thought we'd kick off with an agenda. So we are going to be look at, looking at Australia's extreme China dependence. And for that, we'll hand over to our chief economist, Leif Van Onselen. Uh, and then we'll roll into a general conversation today uh, about the impact of the coronavirus and, of course, some of the work that you've been doing recently, Salvatore, and um, some ref reflections on that as well. And then, as always, we will uh, run through some investment implications on how we use these themes every day at the portfolios uh, in, uh, here at Nicholas Wealth. So we might kick off with uh, Leith, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of a rundown or some background on uh, exactly how important China is to the Australian economy. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Now, uh, China's uh, obviously one of the world's most um, most dependent economies co economies on China, um, and and this comes through principally three areas. So, for, first of all, we've got uh, we we have obviously the the education sector. Um, the the Chinese directly account for uh, accounted for two hundred sixty one thousand international students in the twenty nineteen calendar year, according to the Department of Education, and uh, that. That is most concentrated in the university sector where the Chinese international student enrolments were around 165,000. Um, and that's, that's experienced quite strong growth. Uh, the, the, the total Chinese international student numbers have risen by about 100,000 since 2013. Um, and they are by far Australia's biggest source of international students at around 25%. Um, that also extends over to the tourism industry uh, where, whereby China accounted for about 1.2 million um, tourists in the 2019 calendar year and nearly 16% of total arrivals. And in terms of um, just, just sheer raw export dollars or economic activity, um, education exports in 2019 mm. accounted for about $12.1 billion of exports, whereas Travel exports, so tourism exports from China, accounted for sixteen point seven billion dollars, and again, those of those uh, both of those have experienced incredibly strong growth. And then, of course, the third major area of uh, of of dependence on China is obviously commodities. Uh, China is Australia's biggest market in merchandise exports, accounting for about forty percent of Australia's merchandise exports. And uh, with, with, with export revenue topping $150 billion in calendar year 2019. Now, our special guest, Salvatore, uh, released an excellent report last month uh, looking, e e examining Australia's um, dependence on, on, on exports to China and also the potential costs from the coronavirus. And, uh, and, and Dr. B Dr. Bubones, um, predicted that the virus, the coronavirus, could cost the Australian economy eight billion dollars to twelve billion dollars in lost exports, and and those were th those were pr principally come from three areas: education, tourism, and commodities. Now, now, uh, Salvatore, given in light of the the faster than expected spread in the in the coronavirus, do you think that those uh, those estimates might actually be conservative, and Australia could be looking at even bigger export losses? Well, of course, no one knows the future, not even me. But we are uh, looking at a difficult situation. I mean, even eight to twelve billion in export revenue losses is not the end of the story for the economy. That's just the headline export losses. Uh, what happens in the economy depends on multipliers, depends on how that percolates through the rest of the economy. And you guys are probably better placed to talk about that than I am. I'm really much more focused on globalization and Australia's engagement with the world. I, I mean, let me put Australia's exports to China in perspective. 
you look at countries that are dependent on China as an export market, number one in the world is North Korea. No surprise, 91% of its exports go to China. Number two is Mongolia. Again, you know, a landlocked country that borders China. Number three is Laos, another landlocked country that borders China. 58% of its exports go to China. And if you look for number four in the world, in the company with North Korea, Mongolia, and Laos, it's Australia. <laughs> right? So well, we are more dependent on China than any country that is not a bordering, a poor bordering either dictatorship or semi-failed state. Uh, and number five, get this, Iran. Iran, <laughs> so, yeah. I was, so, I was waiting for Iran, actually, then. <laughs> yeah, so that's the company we're keeping. And, and of course, it's no surprise because Australia is primarily a minerals exporter. We're going to talk a lot about education and tourism, I'm sure. But you know, iron is absolutely number one. Iron exports to China dwarf uh, education exports. Minerals as a total is $94 billion last year in exports to China, and most of that is iron. And then gold is second, so gold is also, you know, gold for, for particular historical reasons having to do with the Bretton Woods system and the former, and the role of gold in uh, the currency reserves. Gold is separated out. That's another $27 billion. So Australia is exporting more gold more fossil fuels, more agriculture to China than it is educational services or tourism. So to put things in perspective, uh, you know, industries like minerals extraction, gold, fossil fuels, even agricultural exports are unlikely to be that hard hit by the coronavirus epidemic. I mean, fossil fuels, as it turns out, it, it may be that the biggest hit to Australia's exports is the unexpected collapse in oil prices to which mm. natural gas contracts are, are typically linked to oil prices. I don't know the structure of Australia's particular natural gas contracts, but assuming yeah, that most, of them, most of them are, most of them are right. especially some of the older ones. Assuming that they're linked to oil prices, the sudden collapse in oil prices this week might actually have a larger dollar value uh, impact on Australia's economy than the education and tourism issues. Yeah, actually, so, so we uh, we actually take a little bit of a different view on that because uh, while while it notionally will, um, the the issue is we get such low amounts of uh, royalties from that, um, it actually doesn't make too much of a difference to, to Australia, and 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 we th we actually think uh, Australia will be a net beneficiary. You know, ironically, we're the biggest exporter of you know uh, LNG in the world, or or they you know, they're about to be the Qatar, but uh, as as they fall. As these prices fall, our manufacturers actually benefit from having lower electricity prices more of than course. what more than what we get because and they're all owned by foreign country companies anyway, whether it's Chevron or or Exxon or or, or these other ones. So so there's a few Australian companies obviously that will that will suffer. But yeah, our, our take is we actually we suspect, and it's very hard to tell. We suspect, you know, um, you know ironically, that falling uh, energy prices is actually a good thing for the for the the real Australian economy. Right, and you guys are the experts. You know, I, I'm not an economist. I'm a sociologist who studies international trade patterns, and so I can talk about the trade flows and how globalization is changing, uh, perhaps in, in response to the coronavirus. Uh, as far as tracing out the actual effect on the Australian economy, I'd have to defer to you know, the to, to, to three of you. But, uh, but this, you know, the, the big issue for us from a policy standpoint is definitely education. And the reason is, of course, that Australia's universities are primarily public universities. And so this is the place where the coronavirus epidemic is directly affecting Australia as opposed to the Australian economy in some broad national sense. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and just on that point, you uh, you released in August last year, um, in, in my view, the best uh, the best single set of research I've ever, ever read on the international student trade. Um, and, and you Very showed... And I should note that both of these papers, the, the coronavirus experts paper and the China student loan paper from last August, were sponsored by the Center for International Studies here. So That's right. And, and, and they're both available on your page on the Center for International Studies website. But, uh, but, but as Salvatore knows, I've, uh, I've, I refer to, those, uh, refer to that paper uh, quite a lot in my writings because uh, it's so good. And actually, um, what, what it showed, and it used data from 2017, which showed that um, that that Australia had had by far the highest reliance on international students in the in the developed world at about twenty five percent, and and of that around around eleven percent of total students 
um, at Australian universities are actually from China, which of course is uh, is most exposed to the coronavirus. And and there's currently uh, estimated around eighty thousand of the two hundred and sixty thousand uh, Chinese students that are, that are unable to commence their studies uh, and are actually trapped overseas because of the travel ban. Right, Australians really should be aware that uh, our situation with international and particularly Chinese students is pathological. I mean, there's no other word for it. If you were to make a league table that combined Australian and North American universities in terms of their numbers of international students, the percentage of all students, Australian universities will occupy the top 20 places of that league wow. table. That is, even wow. a, a middling Australian university has a higher reliance on international students than any university in all of North America. Uh, that's what's incredible. It's not just that we're talking about, uh, you know, University of Sydney or Melbourne or uh, UNSW. We're talking about Central Queensland, <laughs> you know, Charles yeah. Sturt, uh, yeah. Adelaide. You know, e even these universities have higher exposures to international and, in many cases, Chinese students than do any other universities in the English speaking, or, or I should say, any other universities outside China. Uh, we have more Chinese students at, at the University of Sydney than any university in the world outside China itself. And, and by a multiple, uh, uh, you know, the, the most China exposed university in the United States, University of Illinois, we had 5,700 Chinese students. Uh, university of Sydney won't tell us how many we have. Uh, it won't tell us. What I mean is us as in staff members. I'm an associate professor at the University of Sydney. Uh, but the Australian just reported that it's 21,000. In my own paper from last year, I had had to estimate a minimum of 17,500, but I was only, I was trying to be very conservative and take only verifiable numbers. I don't know the true number. They won't tell us. The Department of Education and Training won't tell us. We just don't know. It's, it's so politically sensitive that they simply won't give us the data on which to have a public policy. And so, Salvatore, just um, on that, and it sounds like uh, your university is currently building a wing on the back there in anticipation of more Chinese students. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah. so is there, you know, is, do you think there's going to be some sort of a tipping point perhaps even this year with, in regards to the, um, the travel bans and obviously, you know, the, the drop in revenue? So is this sort of something that's being spoken about? Um, you know, openly or perhaps behind the behind the closed doors? Well, the University of Sydney, to, to give us credit, has been the only one to put a number on the lost revenues to its $200 million. And that's in line with what I expected. I estimated that we received about $600 million a year in Chinese student tuition revenue. That's uh, around a quarter of our entire revenue from all sources. Now, the University of Sydney is more exposed than other universities. The University of Sydney and UNSW both make about a quarter of their total, not total tuition revenues, total university revenues come wow, from wow. Chinese student <laughs> tuition. And for both, that's yeah, it's around 600 million for University of Sydney, around 550 million for UNSW. Uh, each of them, well, University of Sydney is the worst affected because we're on a semester system. UNSW is on a quarter system. It'll probably be, or trimester they call it, it'll probably be less, uh, less affected than us. Uh, University of Sydney thus gets about $300 million a semester in Chinese student revenue, and they have written off $200 million for this semester. So that's all about correct. And, and how's that yeah. being funded? Like, where's, so, so who's, who's really missing out? Is, is, this lost, is it going to be lost employment, or is it just they have to dip into their, um, their savings funds? Or what's, well, or well, they, well they, they, didn't, they didn't listen to me last year, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the feeling of not being listened to. Yes. Uh, <laughs> listened to me last year to set up reserves. Uh, University of New South Wales did announce that it was setting up reserves. University of Sydney, uh, I mean, this is all opaque. Our university accounts uh, follow generally accepted accounting procedures, but they don't uh, break out a liquid reserve. So our reserves consist primarily of revaluations of our property portfolio. So that is, it's not liquid money set aside, it's you know, an accounting procedure to recognize the fact that our property is worth more than it used to and our reserves could disappear overnight if our property is revalued downward. And, and, and it does seem as if there's a little bit of, uh, there's inherent, um, what do you call it, Cic not cyclicality, but there's inherent um, uh, pro-cyclical in terms of if you bring another 20,000 students into, uh, into inner city Sydney, 
then property values will go up. And then if you lose those students, uh, property values will go down again. So you're sort of getting, you know, the more students you have, the more you, you get all these reserves build up. But if you actually lose your uh, students, you could find property prices decreasing at the same time as you've lost your students. So it's sort of like a... Well, that, that's a very good point that I hadn't thought of and certainly something the university should keep in mind. Uh, in response to these $200 million cuts have mainly been uh, deferral of construction on uh, new buildings. So that's been the biggest chunk. And then, of course, it's the usual stuff of uh, swiping staff travel money, um, uh, you know, no new hiring uh, except on grant, uh, grant funded positions. So we've had the, you know, the usual kind of staff and travel freezes. Uh, we don't have an, we don't have a full staff freeze. We have a discouragement then of, you know, we must be extremely careful about only hiring new staff in critical situations, something like that. Uh, but the big money is going to come from construction, from delaying of construction contracts. And that shows you where the money has gone. Uh, if you go to the University of Sydney campus or UNSW campus or UTS in central Sydney, you will see uh, construction cranes everywhere. And that all of that construction is being funded by Chinese student tuition revenue. Wow. <laughs> so that's a, uh, yeah, it sort of doesn't make, it doesn't make you feel warm and fuzzy about what we're doing with the, uh, the proceeds of our, of our ill-gotten gains, does it? It's sort of, you sort of feel as if, well, are we investing in the future? And it's like, no, we're just plowing back into building more stuff so we can bring more over. Well, I, I mean, that's a, that, that's a little unfair. I mean, the gains aren't so much ill-gotten and the construction projects are not unwarranted. <laughs> Uh, but these are, you know, universities should not be in the business of taking risky chances with public mm. money. And, and that's effectively what they've done. They're, they're gambling in the international yeah. student market, and the gamble this year didn't pay off. Uh, yeah. But it also yeah. sounds as if they're property developers with a, with a funded by student, <laughs> by student <laughs> revenue. <laughs> well, that's certainly one way to look at it. Yeah, excellent. Well, I mean, I suppose you must feel a little bit vindicated after coming out early uh, in, in August last year and then uh, and then obviously um, seeing what's transpired now because, um, yeah, I, I, I was reading through your paper last night uh, in preparation for it and, uh, and, 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 the, and, and the warnings were, um, were, were very prescient, I must say. Well, I certainly didn't mention a virus. And, no, no, I, absolutely not. But, 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 uh, but so it, it, yeah. Yeah, I can't take credit for that, but my, my big worry was, and my concern still remains for the yuan. I mean, there's no guarantee that the Chinese yuan will remain convertible for education purposes. Uh, it's not a fully convertible currency. Uh, you, know, you can't just get uh, foreign currency if you live in China. You have to apply for it. And uh, China's economy is taking such a huge hit. I mean, if we think Australia is having economic strain because what a virus! Look at China. Uh, China's kind of economy has taken such an extreme hit that it's still possible that you know, this year or next year there could be a suspension of the convertibility of the yuan. If that were to happen, uh, all the students would disappear, and that's really the nightmare scenario we should still be concerned with. Uh, universities haven't taken on board the lessons. Uh, instead, they feel like you know the worst hit, and they're able to ride it, you know, ride over the ride through the crisis and. They will ride through this crisis. This should be a wake-up call, but I don't think it's going to wake anyone up. And, and in terms of other growth markets, because uh, I often read that um, that that we just need to pivot towards India or some of these other nations now. It, yeah, that's right. And, and, and as you as you noted in your in your last year's paper in August, um, you basically said that India just doesn't have the uh, the, the, the the quantity of middle uh, middle income every, earners to, to to fill the Chinese hole. Every state of India is poorer than every province in China. Uh, if you're going to go to Delhi to recruit students, you may as well go to Tibet. Because Tibet yeah. is richer than Delhi. <laughs> now, we may think of Tibet as a poor, remote province in China, but uh, in strict money terms, uh, Tibet and Xinjiang are richer than the Delhi capital region in, in India. And, and what about... And what about Nepal? What, so we've got, we had a bit of a, a, oh, a massive Russia increase in Nepal. Nepal is pathological. I mean, the, the Nepal, I'm sorry to use that word twice in one podcast, but yeah. it's, it's warranted. Uh, mm. We are taking in four students from Nepal who come to Australia primarily to get a visa. Uh, they go to places like Southern Cross University and uh, culinary schools. And VETs. They're nominally, yeah. yeah, they're nominally allowed to work 20 hours a week. In fact, they're working 60 hours a week uh, just to 
save up money to pay or to pay back the loan sharks back in Nepal. Uh, it's a national travesty. But, yeah, that's uh, right. You know, that's business. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now um, do you believe that the uh, that assuming the coronavirus you know resolves itself and by the end of the year it's over, do you think the the, the international student numbers will bounce back and, and keep surging to record highs in the next uh, going forward? Or do you think that, that, we're, that they're probably peaked and, um, and, and that, that uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the salad days of 2019 are behind us? They, they've peaked and stabilized. And the real problem is that Australia's money universities have built their business models around the idea that these international student numbers will continue to skyrocket, uh, which there's no reason to believe will happen. I mean, I, I've had uh, consulting firms literally call me, not offering me any money, but because they've read my paper and they've been hired by universities to try to scope out international student markets. And I tell them, uh, the, you know, there's no new pot of gold waiting out there. It, it, what we've seen is a step change from one kind of educational economy to a new kind of educational economy. The step change is completed at this point. Uh, but that said, unless there's a crisis, there won't be a collapse. Uh, international student numbers will maintain their current very high levels. And, you know, it's a, I mean, it's an unsustainable, but nonetheless continuable business model. I, I say unsustainable because it's educationally unsustainable. But in business terms, yes, Australia can continue to stuff its classrooms full of international students. Now, the big hit will be a, a one-time uh, hit for 2020, and that's because it, it's not the undergraduate students. Most of the stories have focused on you know, kids traveling through Thailand trying to get to Australia. That's not the big story. The big story for us financially are the master's students, master's in economics and master's in management. And these are the top fee-paying students who are coming for a one-year or a 13-month degree. Many, Most of these students are adults. They're in their 20s. And if they don't come now, they probably won't ever come because life moves mm. on. You get married, mm. you have a kid, you change jobs. I mean, these are people who, many of them are in jobs already taking a year off work to upskill and to you know, upgrade their visa prospects. Uh, if they don't take this year off work, you know, we've lost the cohort. We can't just double next year's cohort to make up for a missed cohort this year. So there'll be a one-time hit to revenues. The universities are going to ride through it. I don't want to be alarmist. I mean, we are going to get through the crisis. The broader economic crisis may continue to show effects down the road, but the university crisis will be over in six months. Uh, it'll be a one-time hit, and we'll move on. Uh, mm. Now, the bigger issue, or the, I should say the broader issue, is how the coronavirus may be reshaping trade patterns, uh, not just for Australia, but for the Pacific as a whole. Yeah. Actually, before you start on this, because I think this is this is what I'd love to spend a, a bit of time on. Sort of our, our thesis was um, that the there was already a big shift in terms of the uh, the, the number of things we've seen uh, with Chinese sort of spying and you know computer chips and 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 Trump sort of trying to bring things back uh, was that there was already a major shift to to bring supply chains out of China and back into um, back into other countries. Uh, and that this is just going to really accelerate that process. And I'd love to you know, hear your thoughts on, on that. Well, supply chains have changed over the last few years. I mean, through the 2020s, most big companies tried to move to a quote-unquote China plus one strategy. The idea being that instead of being entirely focused on China, companies would shift to having China as one of their sources and have a secondary source, secondary source of products in Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, you know, some other place. And that's very obvious, for instance, in the apparel industry. Uh, if you go to department stores, you'll see lots of our clothes are made in China, but department store shelves will stay full because they'll simply switch to their factories in Southeast and South Asia, which will make up for lost China production. Uh, so companies have been had this in the radar screen a long time. Of course, the Trump trade war and the pressure on China emanating that has resulted in even greater shifts of high technology companies trying to shift out of China. Now it's much more, it's, it's much easier to shift garment production to Cambodia than it is to shift uh, your memory chip, chip production from China to Cambodia. But that second shift has already been underway for a while. The trade war has just escalated. Um, 
I don't see this as a deglobalization. I don't think much production is going to go home to the U.S. Uh, I see it as a, a shift in the patterns of globalization, and that was bound to happen anyway. I mean, remember, China has gone from being a low-wage country to being a medium-wage country. Uh, it's no longer any cheaper to produce in China than it is in a country like Malaysia. So the mm. China advantage has substantially deteriorated over the last 10 years. Now, this doesn't mean that globalization is coming to an end, that there's going to be a crash, you know, but it does mean that there's going to be a maybe a broader globalization that pulls other countries in as well. Now, in the short term, there is disruption. I mean, auto parts coming out of China have disrupted assembly lines as far away as Serbia. Uh, we, we, we Certainly, the iPhone production network has been entirely disrupted. Uh, but there is just as much disruption caused by the shutdown of a Samsung factory in Korea, uh, which was hit by coronavirus, as is happening to many factories in China. So this isn't just a China story. Though, of course, in the end, as with so many things, it is a China story. Mm. Okay. Um, and uh, on, on that note, actually, just if we, we are sort of thinking of the broader implications, um, the... There's, obviously, we've spoken a lot about the education piece. Is there, have you covered much in, in the area of tourism? I sort of just having a look at your figures here. It's you know it's a, around about half of, of what education provides um, as a service right. I mean, um, export. There's not much to say about tourism uh, because it's just so uh, transparent. Uh, yep. Tourism has stopped, <laughs> and that's yep. and that's a bloodbath for the tourism industry. And I should be clear: the, the paper I did for the Center for Independent Studies only focused on the China impact on tourism. Now, what's happened since I wrote the paper, which is now a month old, uh, is that coronavirus has spread well beyond China. Yeah, and so there's the travel bans. Sector, right, so China only made up uh, about, you know, one third, China, the China area, China, Hong Kong combined, probably about one third of Australia's tourism export revenues. And Getting hit by a third is bad enough, uh, but effectively almost all tourism is now coming from China, and so that's going to be a much bigger impact. Uh, in fact, if I were to rewrite my paper right now, I, I would say that the, the biggest effect on Australia is the tourism sector, not the education sector. Uh, wow! Well, yep. Because it's 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 a near one hundred percent total wipeout. Now I don't have numbers on that. That's just a guess, but it's a guess that I think. Is probably something we all agree on that nobody is booking trips right now, uh, mm. and you know the tourism sector as a whole is uh, tourism export sector, I should say, not even counting domestic tourism, is twenty two billion dollars a year to the world. Uh, knock off a third of that, figuring that well, even if the coronavirus is over in a few months, it's still going to have lingering effects. So knock a half of that, that's eleven billion dollars. That's as much as my entire estimate of. Uh, Australia's export exposure was one month ago. Yeah, and, and I'm wondering as well. Like, it, it, it would seem to me, at uh, I guess without without having the data to support this, that uh, when you lose some money from the education sector, as you said, that you might delay a little bit of the building, which so that that's a, a negative effect for the building. Um, but and you and you might not hire new people, but the people you've got, you'll probably keep on for a little while. Whereas I'm guessing in the tourism sector, you've probably got a lot more casual workforce and you probably find that um, the, the direct hit probably ends up a lot more in the, uh, in the individuals and, and, and in higher unemployment. Right, almost certainly. Uh, you know, again, I'm not an expert on the tourism sector, but I think we should all be concerned for the people who work in tourism and the people who depend on those people who work in tourism. I mean, you guys can tell me what the multipliers are for these industries. I don't know what the multiplier is for tourism, but I suspect it's very high, especially in specific communities that rely on tourism. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that that's probably a really good segue to actually look at the broader Australian economic impacts. I mean, beyond just obviously the exports, um, which are which are clearly substantial, but the the way it's panning out, and if you look at what what what's happening, what's going on in Italy and some other places that are really shutting down, and obviously uh, China's already been through this. Um, in, in my view, Australia is risking. You know, widespread closures of schools, potentially universities. We've already seen uh, on on the school front, um, St. St. Kevin's in in Melbourne uh, shut down for a few weeks uh, yesterday. There's there was a girls' school in Sydney shut down. Um, Southern 
Ross just announced he was shutting down some campuses. Wow. Okay. So, so, so it's already here in the university sector as well. Uh, and obviously, um, in, anybody who's got younger school children, obviously, if they're, if they're not going to school, they have to stay at home. And, uh, and, and that in turn means that a parent often has to be home to, to, to look after them, which means they don't go, or, they don't go or to a work. Grandpa- or a grandparent, which is the scary bit. Yeah, that's right, because they, because because they're obviously most affected. So, so we're looking at you know potential school widespread school closures, university closures, workplaces uh, losing staff, as 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 we've experienced uh, uh, firsthand uh, working from home. Um, obviously, widespread travel restrictions, not just from overseas, but also domestically. Um, uh, the the cancellation of public events. We saw Miley Cyrus has uh, cancelled her uh, her concert. Uh, she's just one example. Um, my my own son's school uh, today has actually cancelled their um, their their twilight sports event because they don't want to obviously risk spreading it. Um, even Russell Brand was not brave enough to. Uh... <laughs> was it Russell Brand, I think, who uh, cancelled the first? So, yeah. yeah, that's right. It's him as well. And um, yeah, so 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 we're so we're looking at wild, widespread closures and. You know, although it might sound extreme, it's actually uh, you know probably a sensible route uh, given um, to, to to slow the transmission of the virus. But it would have massive um, short term economic effects, um, and you know we'll see this across retail. We'll see it across everywhere where where basically consumers aren't out there spending, um, and it's effectively the 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 tourism travel ban impact on tourism, but everywhere potentially. Um, right. And, and- Unfortunately, unfortunately, the only people who have the resources and the data to really give us a number on this are the Reserve Bank, and the Reserve Bank is not exactly known for being fleet of foot, so uh, we won't get numbers on this probably till after it's long over. Uh, but uh, yes, but of course, this is going to take a toll on the economy. I mean, I, I don't think we should exaggerate it. You know, an economy, a sophisticated economy like Australia's, is not going to ground to a halt as a result of the coronavirus, and we're going to see huge impacts on particular sectors, you know, obviously tourism, conventions, events management, you know, hospitality will be hit very hard. And these are large sectors and they're important and they employ a lot of people. Uh, there'll probably be a much bigger effect on people than on GDP because a lot of GDP is in sectors that aren't particularly disruptable. Uh, you know, obviously mining, uh, but also agriculture, uh, chemicals production, uh, Australia still has a you know, meaningful manufacturing sector, even though it's you know, far smaller than it used to be. Uh, you know, consumer products will continue to be sold. Toilet paper is going to be restocked. <laughs> and, uh, and all of that will continue to happen. Right? So it, it's really, it, it's people who are much more vulnerable, not just to illness, but people who are vulnerable to the destruction of their lives economically people who are going to have trouble making their mortgage payments. Uh, you know, this is really where it's going to be felt, not in the GDP statistics. I mean, GDP may decline 1% or 2%. That would be bad, but that wouldn't be epic. You, you know, That wouldn't be something we'd still be talking about years later. Uh, the effect on people's lives will uh, really be disruptive, and disruptive economically as well as uh, in terms of their own health. Yeah, I mean, that's we're, we're certainly, very, from an economic perspective, um, we're taking the, the line that um, exactly what you've said with the universities about setting aside reserves and all that type of stuff. And everyone's like, no, 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 everything will be fine forever. Um, we, you know, in our view, there's a lot of corporates out there in that same boat who have just gone, yeah, we'll gear up and we'll, do, we'll buy back our own shares and we'll do all this, you know, we'll run everything close to the line without any, without too much slack. And that's, that's the problem we're seeing is that, you know, there could easily be debt crises coming from that. And then, and then that, um, yeah, that extends then across to the uh, the the people as well, as you said. You know, there's a lot of people who uh, unemployment for for three or six months, and then all of a sudden have to end up selling their selling their houses, or you know, or less than that. You know, that before they they run out of room, there's just we've, we've run our entire economy um, without much slack in it, and then this is. Uh, well, well, your finger is much closer to the pulse of the bond markets than mine is. Uh, yeah, I think the the minerals, the, the miners have the resources, right? They're, they're not going under. In fact, even the iron price has risen. I mean, after an initial fall in iron futures, iron prices, spot prices are now higher than they were before the crisis. And they're used to dealing with this kind of volatility. I mean, to put things in perspective, iron prices right now are two times what they were just a couple of years ago. So there's a lot of, you know, they have a lot of, headroom a lot of fat. To take. Yeah, That's they have a lot of headroom to take losses. On the other hand, uh, Companies like tourism operators and hospitality companies operate with 
no slack, and they don't take out insurance, and this is one of the big problems, is they don't insure against events like this. Uh, the South by Southwest Music Festival, you'd, you'd think that mm. a music festival would take out insurance, right, against something that would, you know, they, they could have a tornado, they could, I mean, all sorts of things could cause a music festival to be suspended, uh, yet they're facing potential bankruptcy because they didn't have insurance. And I think lots of Australian organizations will be in similar trouble. If they just didn't envisage that the carousel would ever come to a stop. Uh, and so they never took out insurance against business disruption. Uh, and you know, this is going to be a, a wake-up call to all of them that they should have insured. And, and you know, although insurance itself will take a big hit as a result of the coronavirus, uh, it might make hay for the next decade as a result of reminding people about uh, their lack of insurance they had now. Uh, mm. so one thing I'd like to ask you guys about is the, uh, pre precisely you mentioned uh, people paying mortgages. And uh, in the United States, of course, I I'm American, as you can probably hear, uh, all of that is uh, put into uh, collateralized debt obligations. So you, banks don't hold mortgages, investors hold mortgages from CEOs. That's mm. what caused the 2007, 2008 financial crisis in the first place. In Australia, are mortgages repackaged as bonds or are mortgages held by the banks? It's a, it's a bit of both, but it's mostly, uh, it's mo it, it, it's mostly bank held debt. Um, the, the, the securitization market in Australia is very small in comparison to the, to, to the American one. Mm. Yeah, so the, bank, the banks are the ones on the, on the line, but I, I guess partly as well, uh, there's four big banks that make up maybe 80% or is it? Yeah, it's about, so, so, so I've got obviously four, the, the, the big four banks, NAB, CBA, uh, Westpac and ANZ are, are, are by, by far the dominant players. And they, and as Damien said, they count, they, they count for, yeah, close to 80% of total mortgage lending. So yeah. it's, we've got extreme concentration. And, and so they've all notionally got government backing from, uh, from the financial crisis that sort of never really went away. Yeah. And so. Too big um, to fail. Yeah, so so I guess the the worst case is, well, not the worst case, but yeah, I think that's we've certainly got a very concentrated risk. Let's put it that way. And and um, you know, will we need government? But if, if things go wrong, governments will need to step in. And it's not like they can let. Um, it's not like you have a three hundred banks and you can let a few smaller ones fall over. Um, yeah. And of course, what I think what most of us would like to see is government support going to people who are having trouble making mortgage payments instead of government support going to the banks to bail them out for their bad business decisions. In, in the end, right. both routes will eventually will ultimately bail out the banks. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is bailing out ordinary, ordinary Australians. They're the ones who really need it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. It's just on the, on the supply chain side. Um, so, so do you know, I mean, this, given how complex the supply chains are, uh, what sources do you use for for trying to look into the the effects on the supply chains and and uh, you know taking out one part of it and 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 where the uh, where things are going to pop up sort of down the line that that you never expected? We have very little systematic data on this. The only systematic data ultimately come from the UN's Comtrade database and uh, databases derived from that, which record imports and exports. So we don't know what particular companies are doing, unless they've told us or unless reporters have uh, found examples uh, of supply chain. So uh, we don't really know how complex uh, production networks are across East Asia and around the world. But we all kind of suspect, based on the qualitative research, uh, what sort of patterns replicate themselves. Uh, there's been a lot of qualitative research, especially in sociology and in management, on how companies uh, organized production networks in East Asia. There's much less research on Europe and the rest of the world. In East Asia, the typical model is for sophisticated components to come from, to continue to come from countries like Korea, Japan, uh, and Taiwan, and then to go to China for assembly. Uh, China's been working its way up those value chains, uh, but it's still not there. For example, China now dominates the market for memory chips but it is a minor presence in the more sophisticated processors and almost non-existent in specialty chips, uh, like video processing chips. Uh, so final product, final assemblies in China, but most of the components come from East Asia or even the United States. In fact, uh, the processors, I think, for the iPhone uh, are a U.S. processor that's sent to Asia for assembly into the iPhone. So these networks are probably not as China dependent as people 
make out. Uh, the, so the, the supply chains that are China dependent are mainly for low value added sort of products. For example, I gave, I gave the example earlier of auto parts. You know, many basic auto parts are made in China, and if you can't get the fastener that you need, that's specially designed for a particular part in your automobile, well, that fastener can hold up your entire car production mm. for a few weeks. Yep. And, and that, that is a problem. That said, China is getting back to work. The first places in China that are going back to work are the factories. It's the, um, you know, the assembly plants will probably be second, and only later will the office workers all be back at work. Uh, so those factories that turn out crucial components First, would have had inventories to begin with, and second, are getting back to work. Now, supply chains have not been studied, to my knowledge, in Europe. And we're all focused on China, because here we are in the Pacific region. But honestly, Australia is not particularly exposed to the Chinese economy. Uh, I mean, Australia does not participate in China-centered production networks. Only about 8% of Australia's exports to China uh, consist of intermediate goods. So those are goods that could even potentially be part of a uh, supply chain or production network. Uh, Australia mainly exports minerals, let's face it, uh, and services. Uh, so Australia is not particularly a China story when it comes to supply chain and production networks. As far as the global economy goes, the bigger impact might actually be in Europe. Uh, Europe, remember, is you know a highly integrated economic zone. That's what the European Union has been all about, you know, integrating production across Europe. And Europe has fully internal production networks for things like automobiles, for example. You know, most most parts that go into a German automobile or an Italian automobile are sourced in Europe. Uh, the parts factories are farther east in Europe, so they're in the Czech Republic, in Poland. There's even been some movement to a very low wage work going to Ukraine. Uh, and Europe, of course, is just now dealing with coronavirus. Italy has announced a nationwide travel restrictions, which is kind of reminiscent of what happened in China. Uh, mm. So if these European production networks are disrupted, uh, I think that would end up having a much bigger overall impact on the global economy than the disruption of China centered production networks. And that's a story no one's talking about because we just don't think of Europe in the same way. You know, but you know, the world's largest exporter is China. Let's not forget the world's second largest exporter is Germany, and it's not second by much. Yeah, mm. and, and our, our take on on um, yeah, we're, we're following the coronavirus stats very clo closely, and we've been looking a lot at uh, you know, where people are catching the disease as, as opposed to where they're being diagnosed. Right. And um, Italy, by far and away, is the biggest exporter of people with coronavirus at the moment. So, so you know, if you look at <laughs> if you look at somewhere like China, you know, the people coming. People getting coronavirus in China and then going to other countries has actually um, decreased substantially, and whereas Italy's far and away, you know, in front in terms of the number of people. And it just seems to say that there's an underlying, um, and and people still haven't really cut the, they, they haven't changed the their their interactions. Like Australia's got bans on South Korea, China, uh, Iran, but sort of special dis dispensation for Italy, for Italy, which is actually giving more more corona cases than anyone. And so it's well, almost a, sorry. And on top of that, Italian Italian travel bans are not, the internal travel bans are nowhere near as tight as China's were. Uh, and of course, there are open borders across the European Union. That's the whole point of the European project is open borders. So Italians can freely travel throughout Europe. There was some talk in Austria of closing borders that was quickly uh, slapped down by the European Union. It's you know, simply, a, it's a gross violation of European Union rules. And in order to, you know, maintain their political project of freedom of movement, uh, Europe may end up becoming the real center of the coronavirus epidemic. Uh, of course, we have that in the United States as well. There, there are no, no, no restrictions whatsoever on travel within the U.S. Uh, but again, the U.S. is not the kind of manufacturing powerhouse uh, that Europe is. So I, I like to remind people that countries like the United States and Australia have become too rich to manufacture. You know, our economies, like, people lament the loss of manufacturing, but the simple fact is, who would want to manufacture in Sydney? You know, wages are too high, land is too valuable. It's not the kind of place where you'd want to put a big assembly plant. And the same is true of much of the United States. It's just become too rich to be a, 
assembly uh, assembly uh, uh, focus of assembly plants. Now, from the coronavirus standpoint, that's actually a protective factor in that you know, people like us can work from home, not forever, not without any loss in productivity, but we can get through. Uh, but you can't run a factory from home, and so mm-hmm. I think the next big impact, economic impact from coronavirus is actually going to be the European Union, which remains not a low-wage manufacturing center, but a medium-wage manufacturing center. Uh, the European Union simply does not have levels of GDP per capita or sophistication of economy comparable to Australia or the United States. Hmm. Okay. It's more yeah, look, but, yeah, look, that, and that, that makes a lot of sense. So um, there you go. There's something perhaps to, to, uh, to, to throw in the mix, Damien, for, uh, for our portfolios. It's, yeah. Uh, potentially get a lot worse before it gets better. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're certainly expecting it to get very bad in in yeah, in in uh, Europe, but we're also we also think the US is pretty ripe as well for um, for for uh, cases to run throughout the US, just given there's uh, you know generally no paid sick leave and uh, oh, absolutely, and, and it's still very unclear as to the how the um, whether people who don't have insurance can actually get tested for for free right. at the moment. No, yeah. no, I, 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 Absolutely, it'll affect the U.S. I mean, the testing will happen in the U.S. Most uh, communicable diseases in the United States are managed by county, county health departments, not by hospitals. And so, hmm. you know, that, that that responsibility will be taken on by county health departments, I'm pretty certain. But it already has been in New York City and in, uh, and in Oregon. Uh, so the testing will happen. The care is more an issue in the United States. But the point I'm making is that the U.S. and Australian economies are not as vulnerable to disruption. Of the we supply get, chain, yeah. Yeah, we may get just as many cases, but it won't cause a breakdown in our ability to produce value. Mm-hmm. It would be specific sectors that are affected, like tourism, like hospitality, like education, without it causing a general disruption of the economy. Now, in China, the entire economy had to stop because you couldn't get a thousand people together in an assembly plant without risking the entire plant getting sick. And Europe has a similar kind of economy, uh, much more similar to China's than it is similar to ours or America's. And that's why I expect that whatever the numbers of cases or numbers of deaths, the economic disruption will likely be higher in the European Union than in the United States or Australia. And and what do you think uh, the UK? on that same basis, do you, do you put them more in the the Australia? Yeah, more like US, US and Australia. I mean, yeah. uh, look, finance. Uh, I mean, finance obviously is affected by stock market drop, but yeah. but finance is not an is not a business where work will have to stop because of coronavirus. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the, yeah. The, the big London banks are going to continue to operate. They'll just tell staff to stay home. Hmm. On the other hand, the big German auto manufacturers are extremely vulnerable to supply chain disruptions. They're extremely vulnerable to plant closures. Uh, you know, they're the ones who are more likely to feel the impact uh, than the services based economies of the Anglo-Saxon world. Mm. And Japan, what do you say? Japan has taken uh, very extreme measures. I mean, I, I think we all have, uh, you know, we all have a lot of faith in Japan's uh, ability to deal with the crisis. Just look at Fukushima, and mm-hmm. you know, for all that things went wrong, uh, it took a, an earthquake, a tidal wave, and a nuclear meltdown <laughs> to close Fukushima Prefecture. Mm-hmm. And you know, the coronavirus is nothing compared to what they went through with that. Uh, also, I think uh, if we contrast Japan and Italy, I- I'm sorry to make these kind of broad, you know, these broad uh, stereotyping conclusions, but if you tell people to stay at home in Italy, good luck. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. People, if you tell people to stay at home in Japan, they'll stay home. Uh, you yeah. know, people will wear masks. People will people mm. will take government advice and obey it uh, in Japan voluntarily in, mm. in a way that they won't in Italy. I mean, in China, they had to force people to obey government advice. They had to weld doors shut on apartment buildings. They had to have police stand outside every neighborhood. I mean, I have friends in China who were telling me that they had to have their ID card recorded if they wanted to leave their 
ghettoed block. You know, you can wow. stay in your block, but if you leave the block, you can't come back in. Uh, you know, that sort of heavy restrict, handed restriction. Well, in Japan, the government tells people to stay home, they'll simply stay home. The government tells people to wear a mask, they'll simply wear a mask. And yeah. so Japan will probably do better than most of us uh, in, in terms of keeping the virus under control. Mm. Uh, that said, who knows? I mean, but, but Singapore yeah. has been successful. I mean, considering yeah. Singapore remains open as the transport hub of Southeast Asia, uh, and it continues to do business uh, despite mm. all of its exposure to coronavirus, I think that's probably a model of what will happen in Japan. Yeah. Sorry, and where I was getting to on Japan, though, as well, is just in terms of economy structure. I mean, how do you, do you see them? So they obviously used to be a lot more like China and, and Europe. Right, but um, right. in oh, terms they, of this... Oh, they're very much like Europe in, in terms of being a manufacturing dependent economy that uh, depends on these global production networks. And the difference is that Japan is likely to control the epidemic from a public health standpoint. I mean, mm. the same number of cases in Japan as in Europe would have the same kind of economic impact. I just strongly suspect that Japan will keep its case count under control. Yeah. Uh, where well, Europe, well, at least more so than Europe. Yeah. yeah. Much more so than Europe. I mean, Japan. Yeah. Is, you know, Japan, like Singapore, is likely to be successful in preventing the community spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. Yep. Excellent. Very good. Right. Okay. Wonderful. Well, look, um, mindful of your time, Salvatore. So, um, just while, just in wrapping up, um, have, would you mind sharing with us some ways that our listeners can get in touch with you and follow some of your work that you've been doing, both uh, previous and ongoing? Oh, that's very generous of you. I mean, I have a monthly newsletter. If you just go to salvatorebonus.com, you'll find a sign up link. And of course, I've been working with the Center for Independent Studies on these kind of issues, and all the articles I've written, or most of them at least, are available on my Center for Independent studies page. You can just search CIS South for bonus you can easily find it. Uh, and you can read a lot of the articles uh, outside the usual paywalls of the CIS website. Excellent. Okay, very good. Well, look, thanks again for your time today, and we look forward to getting you back on the show sometime soon. Thanks a lot. I'd love to. All the best. Well, that's it for now, and thanks for watching. If you like what you heard today, and you'd like to hear more, head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash subscribe. Give us your email address and in return we'll send you a weekly email with new webinar topics, links for our podcasts and other news from Nucleus Wealth. I certainly hope you've got something out of today as I have and we'll look forward to catching you at the next one. Cheers.